As we get into the Word of God today, you can join me in turning in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. And you got Bibles in front of you that are the same translation as mine if you don't have your own with you, either in digital or in print. And you can follow along Acts chapter 16. We are going to be starting in verse 16. And so as long as you can remember the number 16, you can find where we are at throughout this message. Acts 16, 16 is where we're going to start. And it starts us by finding us in the book of Acts, but finding us in the town of Philippi. And so a little bit later on in your New Testament, you would know the book of the Philippians, written to the people of, the, of Philippi. And so here um, is they are in Philippi. And I remember me speaking from Philippians a couple of months ago. I mentioned that Paul was saying to those people, you remember those times of trouble I had. You helped me during my time of suffering. Well, this is one of those moments where there's suffering in Paul's life where it's mentioned in Acts previously that it's referred to. It doesn't mean that's only the troubles that Paul is referring to in the book of Philippi, but it's one of them that could have been included and re referenced in that passage. So Acts chapter 16, verse 16, has Paul and Silas on their way to a prayer meeting. It says they're going to a place of prayer. They're on their way to a prayer meeting, and then there's this slave woman who is demon-possessed, who is following them around. And she is declaring in verse 17, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She might be demon-possessed, but this is truth. She's telling people who these people are and the message that they are delivering. She's saying these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Nothing wrong about it. But it's so frustrating to Paul and Silas, and especially Paul in this text, because it seems as though it's distracting. It seems as though that she's making a commotion. It's almost uh, erasing the good that they're doing. And as they're on the way to the place of prayer, and it's probably going over in his mind, it says this continues for many days, where she follows them everywhere and is telling everyone, hey guys, these people are servants of God. Hey guys, these people are telling you how to be saved. And you know, for most of us, you know, that, that could be awkward, it could be weird, but it's also kind of like, okay, well, now people know who I am. But Paul has a different perception on this because in verse 18, it says, He became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left. Paul had that discernment in his spirit, not to condemn the woman, but to condemn the spirit. He knew that this was spiritual. It wasn't anything to do with her, whether it was he could see things within her in the physical, or whether he just straight up was led by the spirit to her spirit, and says, this is an evil spirit within her that is causing a disturbance in what it is we're going about our daily task. And so he says, out of annoyance, but by the power of the Spirit, he turns to her and casts the Spirit out. And she's free. She's free. It's a miracle. Because, you know, I, as a human being, we can't turn to another human being and tell a, a spirit to get out of them. It's only by the work of the Holy Spirit that we can work in the spiritual in, in that way of freeing someone from a demon possession. And so here, this slave woman is now free. That leads us into verse 19, where it references her owners. Her owners don't care for this woman, which is shown here in verse 19, because they're not concerned about her well-being. Oh, she's free now. We didn't know. They said all they're worried about is that she was going around and telling people fortunes, and they were making money off of her in a sense of, hey, you want to know what's going to happen in your future? Pay us this much money, and this lady will tell you everything you need to know, because spirits exist outside of our physical world, and so they know things beyond what me and you know. They see things beyond what you and I can see. That's why there's power in the light, but there's also power we have to reference and be acknowledging in the dark of the spiritual realm. And so here, these men, these owners, are so upset that their way of income is now no more. They have no care for this woman and who she was, who she is, who she will be now that she's free. They were just worried about their pocketbook. 
So here's what they do. They seize Paul and Silas, verse 19, drag them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They're going to take everyone out, and they're saying, we're dragging these guys by the scruff of their neck into a public place where there's people all around, where people are now going to be judging one another, like bringing them before the police, bringing them before a literal judge, and saying, this is what's happening here. They're so upset of what these two spiritual leaders have done, what these two Christians have done, what these two people of prayer have done, men of God. So that could be you and I. It could be you and your spouse. It could be your children have done something in obedience to the Lord, have done something good, not worthy of any sort of consequence whatsoever, and yet we're dragged into a public place, into a, maybe an online public forum just because someone else was offended. Do we hear what's going on in Scripture today? And so it says in verse 20, they brought Paul and Silas before the magistrates, the authorities, and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. And that's just completely false. They've taken their offense and they said, well, it offends us of what you did, but we can't tell people exactly what you did because that's not really breaking any laws. And so they drag them out here and say, these foreigners who you don't know, hello, it's, it's me and Bill. Like, everyone knows me and Bill. And so, like, you guys got to trust what we're saying. And so they make up all these things about these foreigners who no one knows. And they say that they're stirring up a city, they're doing everything wrong, they're trying to wreck our customs. And that leads into verse 22 where it says the crowd joined in now against Paul and Silas. Meaning that, you know, we could have people in this community. We could have people in your friendship circles. We could have people in Canada. People somewhere in your life where, you know, you might have done something completely good. You might have done something that was obedient to the Lord. You might have helped somebody. And now you have people who are saying other things that aren't even truth, but they're trustworthy to the crowd. And so the crowd follows them. And it feels as though the whole world is against you now. And there's all those questions of, but what did I really do? What really happened? What's all going on here? Because it says here in the latter part of verse 22, those magistrates, those authority figures, they sided with the crowd. They ordered Paul and Silas to be stripped and beaten with rods. So now they were dragged to a public place. They were lied about, falsely accused, then they were realizing everyone else is turning against them, even though they didn't do anything to anyone else. And now they're being stripped naked and beaten with rods in front of everyone for everyone to see and for everyone seemingly to be in agreement with. This is the situation Paul and Silas are in just simply because they were doing something to free someone in the spirit. They were doing things in obedience to the Lord's prompting in his heart, the Lord's power. They can't do that on their own. It's only by the Lord's power. So verse 23, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. The jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. So now we have the jailer putting them into not just prison, but into the inner cell. Inner cell can be referenced here as saying there's no external walls. They're put in stocks within the inner cell, so they're even that much more secure. It's the most secure place of the prison. So they got out of the stocks somehow. They found a way out of the inner cell. They're still within the jail itself. They still have to get out from other, way, um, other cells where prisoners are, other access points to the outside world. They are in the most secure place in prison. This is where they find themselves. Sometimes we can find ourselves seemingly in stocks in an inner cell. We can turn to one another and say, I don't even know how we got here. I, I don't see the, the path. I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. 
We can look around us and say, all I did was just hold fast to my morals. All I did was step out in faith and obedience to God. God wanted me to go here, and I went there. Was I, was I not supposed to go here? Because that's, you know, we can, um, we can think that's maybe what Paul and Silas could have done. They could have argued with one another, and Silas could have said to Paul, you shouldn't have done that, Paul. Or Paul could have turned to Silas and said, I'm sorry. He, there's none of that recorded in Scripture. But sometimes that's maybe our response. We doubt, well, how did we get here? Am I supposed to be in prison? Well, this isn't how it was supposed to turn out. I freed someone from demon possession. You know, that's a good thing, right? What's all going on here in a foreign nation, you know, where we don't have that familiarity with people? We don't really have that complete understanding of the culture, maybe. And here, in verse 25 is where we see Paul and Silas' reaction. It says, about midnight, which means, you know, after all this had happened throughout the day, the strain on their physical bodies are enough to have them fall asleep. But it says, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. So they're still in stocks. They're still in the inner jail cell. They're still in prison. They're still naked, bleeding from the beating that was severe, it's described as. They're still wrongfully accused and are very much aware that the words probably getting out amongst the community that things were said and done which actually weren't said and done. So they know that there's a reputation already being formed for them. But in that moment, at midnight, when they're added to all of that physical tiredness and weariness, and darkness, because they're in an inner cell. There's no moonlight coming in. There's no lights on, which will be referenced later. It's dark. They choose to pray. They choose to pray. They have their eyes focused on God, not on their wounds, not on the future, not on rethinking the past. They choose in that moment to turn to God and pray. And the other cellmates in different cells of the prison are listening. They're used to hearing people maybe cry their first night in prison, mumble around meaninglessly. They might have had some people see them come in so they know that they've been stripped and beaten, they're bleeding, they don't look very good. They know the worst of the worst of the worst end up in these inner cells. But then now they're hearing from those inner cells tonight, people who are praying intelligibly And vocally, out loud, to God in an ungodly culture. So now they're soaking it up and like, man, this isn't all of our other gods who we worship for this and for that and for that, who we make sacrifices to for this. We've been taught about since we were little about that and that and that. This is a different God. And so they're listening and they're learning and they're picking it up. But soon, Paul and Silas' prayers turn into songs of praise songs of worship, songs of adoration. Once again, the prisoners are used to maybe hearing songs from one another. Maybe people who come in that same day and are still drunk or high or demon possessed and are singing this random, unintelligible mumble stuff. And here, though, as they're listening to the songs, they're like, no, these are songs that make sense. These are songs directed towards God. These are songs about love. These are songs about forgiveness. These are songs about peace. Who are these men? What God is this they are talking about? They are talking with. They are singing songs to. And the prisoners are pressing in through the bars of their own jail cells. Those prisoners might have been wrongfully convicted. They might have been rightfully convicted. They might be deserving to be in jail. But for that moment, they are tuned into the two believers who find themselves in a jail cell that they are undeservingly in. See, God can have us go through some terrible things in this life and yet end up exactly where he needs us to be. Because Paul and Silas would never have been able to reach these prisoners with their message in the marketplace, their message in a prayer meeting, their message in someone's house at this time. But their message reaches all of these prisoners. 
because now they're in stocks in an inner jail cell in prison after being stripped and beaten and wrongfully accused and having the crowd turn against them. It's not how Paul and Silas drew it up. It's not how you and I draw it up. But wherever circumstance we find ourselves in, we have a choice. Are we going to focus on that circumstance? Are we going to second guess ourselves? Or are we going to still have our eyes focused on God? Are we still going to be of the right spiritual mindset? We're saying we're grounded in God. God is still God no matter what I have gone through today. And so God, I choose to pray you. I pray, pray to you. God, I still choose to sing songs of worship to you. God, I still choose to do so publicly, outwardly, not just inwardly whispering with one another, not just silently because I know you can hear my thoughts, God, but outwardly expressing their faith. That's the choice Paul and Silas make that I hope that we can make today, that we can make this week, we can make this month and throughout this year and the days ahead beyond this year. Where we say, God, my circumstances do not dictate my faith. Because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whether I'm going through something good, whether I'm going through something bad, you are still good. So I choose to still pray. I choose to still worship. And here in verse 26, suddenly, which means in the midst of all of this, they're still in their stocks in the inner cell. Suddenly, as all the prisoners are listening... Suddenly, as they are continually choosing to praise and to pray, despite where they're at, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. I don't know what your perception of a violent earthquake might be that would shake the foundations of a jail cell, but they don't have the technologies back then that we have today. There's no button that pushes and everyone's jail jail doors fly open. Here's a jail cell, which, you know, in a sense is more archaic than that. It needs a key for everything. It needs, they all open individually. A giant earthquake, as we've seen pictures and videos of on news and media outlets before, you know, things crumble. One jail cell might pop open, the other one might be crushed, the other one might be all boxed in, the walls are caving in, the ceiling's coming down, but here it says, the violent earthquake which shook the foundations of the prison had every jail cell door pop wide open, and every person in that jail had their chains fall off. That's big. Because it's more than just physical. It's more than just God showing what he can do in the physical. It's referring to what is happening in the spiritual. He's saying, oh no, no, I'm not just coming to show my favor upon Paul and Silas. All you other prisoners who have done other things previous to this day, who are listening in, who are soaking in this message of God and of faith through people in terrible circumstances... Your jail cells come open too through prayer. Your chains come off through worship of our God. That's not just physical, that's spiritual. Where our prayers open up cell doors. Where our worship have chains fall off of addiction, of abuse, of certain routines in life, of things we just can't understand. When we surrender ourselves to God, our desire for revenge, our own understanding, we come before God open. We say, God, I don't understand it all, but I do know that you are still here and you are still for us. And I choose you. Jail cells in your heart pop open. Chains fall off your ankles. And you're free. Why? Because he says, cast all your burdens upon me, for I care for you. I'll take on your burden. You take on mine, which is light. It's freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from all other things that are bound to limitations on this earth. See the parallel between the physical world and the spiritual one. The temporary one. Temporary life and the eternal life. Verse 27, the jailer woke up now because there's an earthquake. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword, was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. 
Here's where the jailer is going through a lot of different things in his mind. We can see that he was told specifically about Paul and Silas, be careful to guard these ones in particular. The jailer chose to put them in the inner cell. Now the jailer looks and he says, not just is the inner cell door open, all the jail cell doors are open. The main door out to the public is open. I didn't even hear anyone get out. I didn't see anything. What's going on here? They're all going to blame me. They're going to throw me into prison. They're going to kill my family. They're going to fine us. And whatever is ahead of me, I just know that it's better for me to die in this moment to go through the punishment I'm going to need to endure. And so he goes to kill himself in those moments, in that moment. But even for someone like a jailer, in that moment in time, God cares for him. And he prompts Paul to shout out through the darkness, through the cloud of all the rubble caused by the violent earthquake. And he says, don't harm yourself. We're all still here. Now, he doesn't call out and say, oh, me and Silas, we stay in the inner room because we're good Christians. We're just going to wait around and be honest with you and let you know our cell door is open. Um, They didn't do that. He said, all of us are still here. No one's escaped. Why would no one escape? They all had their cell doors open. Their chains fell off. Their stocks popped open. Everyone has the ability to choose now. But... Those other prisoners, as soon as their doors flew open, as soon as they were free from their chains, they didn't run back to the way things used to be. They didn't go back to the familiar. They didn't try to just get out and just take it as it goes one moment at a time. They drew closer to those who chose to honor God in the midst of their darkest day. They say there's something about these two individuals. There's something about their God I want to get close to them. So wherever they go, I go. We heard that two months ago from Ruth, talking to her mother-in-law, Naomi. We see that through the Gospels, when Jesus simply asks us to lay down our fishing nets and to follow him. To leave our father and our mother and follow him. To surrender ourselves daily, as we sung about, and follow him. And here the prisoners, without any sort of other influence that is godly, once they're free to make a choice for themselves, they choose God. They choose to draw near to the Christian and say, there's faith here beyond anything I've ever experienced. I want to know more. And if we were to continue on, which we're not, it shows that the jailer and all his family are saved that night And they're water baptized. They're going beyond just that moment. They're saying, we're committing this point onwards because something has happened here that I have never seen in my career as a jailer. Those other cellmates, there's something here I've never seen from another prisoner. There's something here I never saw in the outside world either. We think God is so offensive to other people sometimes. That it keeps us from being obedient to him. We're worried about what it might mean for ourselves. And so we say, "Ah, God, please, just not this time. Please, just to someone else. I've done that before, but, you know, I'm just not feeling it today. God lays things in your path for a reason. And it says his word will not return to him void. It will accomplish every purpose it sets out to accomplish. So no matter what we're going through today, no matter how tough today might be, no matter how tough these last couple of weeks might have been for you, no matter how tougher the next few months might be for you, I challenge you to return to a text like this, which is recorded in scripture for a reason for you today. That you have a choice. And I hope and pray alongside of you that you choose, as Paul and Silas did, to still have your eyes focused on God. To still pray. To still worship. To still be outward in your faith. To still be obedient. No matter what it may or may not mean for you in the unseen. We're not guaranteed rewards on this earth. 
we're also not guaranteed that every time we're obedient, it will lead to a public beating. But we are just called to be obedient to God. And no matter what the outcome of that is, we should still choose to worship him with our whole being. So invite us now to bow our hearts and heads where we're at. And let God continually speak to you in this moment. Continue to go over what the Spirit might be leading you to reflect on over these last few weeks. Things that have been going on. Things that are still in your heart today that you brought here with you. I encourage you, if your hearts are heavy, if your spirit is dry, surrender yourself to the Lord today and allow him to refresh you. See this world, not just through your limitations, but through God's unlimited grace and mercy. He will be your strength to lift you up. He works all things together for good for those who live according to his purposes. Let's turn our eyes away from the stalks on our feet. The windowless jail cell we find ourselves in which leaves us really hopeless. There's no promise for Paul and, Tim, or Paul and Silas that they're going to get out. They're just there. Let God speak to you in this moment for what this text might be saying to you. For what God would be leading you into where he says, trust in me. Where he says, I am all that you need. Where he says, I've gone before you. I know this is a tough time for you, but there's still good for you to accomplish within this time. Take this opportunity just to reflect with the Holy Spirit's leading onto what this might mean for you to put into action moving forward from here. Still with your head bowed and your eyes closed. You want to admit before God today and say, God, I'm going through something. But whatever that something is, I choose to trust in you. If that's you, just raise your hand. This is a sim symbol of what is going on in your heart. God, I'm going through something, but I choose to trust in you. If that's you, just raise your hand. Amen. Thank you. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you today that you are active. Times, Lord God, where we as can't even see it. At times where it's right in front of our face. Lord, we thank you that you are continually in motion. You're continually going before us and winning the battles for us. You're continually, Lord God, wishing that we would tap into your spirit so that we would have the words to say, the actions to do it. Help us, Lord, to have faith, even when faith doesn't seem to be our first priority sometimes. Lord, forgive us of our wrongs and help us, Lord God, to be reminded to surrender ourselves to you moment by moment, that we will give you everything of ourselves. 
Lord, we're thankful we can gather in your house today. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful, Lord God, that you choose to speak even within those inner cell moments of our life. That you hear us, that we're never too far from you. We're thankful, Lord God, for your great spirit, your great presence here. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.